Hi there. I'm Jason, and I make music as Sycamore Willow, but today I'm not making music. Today is tech shop talk. Tech shop talk. Tech talk? So uh, what we're going to work with is how you connect an old tape recorder like this. This is the Uhr 4000 report monitor. Uh, I've got some videos where I use it and talk about how I use it, and as a result, I get messages from people saying, hey, I bought one of those tape recorders too. How do I hook it up to my stuff? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So like I said before, I get lots of messages about how I hook things up to my Uhr. Um, in fact, just recently a friend on Instagram asked me for advice on how to connect their Uhr up, and I decided it's time to make a video about this uh, to help all those people out there who might have this question. So in the process of making this video, I'm going to build a little box like this and I'm gonna mail it off to them uh, just because um, uh, uh, they're nice and I like doing nice things for nice people okay so anyway so the dilemma is what why do we even have to worry about this you'll notice that the Uber has these connectors on the side and um, I'm gonna cut to the chase and say that we're gonna connect to the radio input output but you'll notice that plug is not an XLR or a TRS or a TS cable. Now, if you don't know what any of those things are, you probably recognize them from hooking up microphones and guitars and synthesizers. But you might recognize this cable, right? It looks pretty familiar. Looks like one of these, one of these MIDI cables. So that is not um, technically a MIDI cable. The output is what's known as a DIN5, or some people say DIN5. Uh, DIN stands for Deutsche Institut für Normung. Pardon my German, please. But in English, that would be the German Institute for Standards. So uh, this familiar shape for MIDI, you know, we use that a lot. But it's, it's in the past, this just format of cable has been used for lots of other things, including audiovisual equipment. So um, my thinking was I didn't want to take my MIDI cable and hack the end off it or build a MIDI cable from scratch, which would be a real pain because there's so many uh, wires in there. But I have MIDI cables around for the what little MIDI I do. And I want to be able to connect it to something like this that'll go in my synthesizer. But in this case, I want it to go into something like this to go into my OP1, uh, which is for sure a thing I do. I tape OP1 stuff to get that nice tape sound. So what would I be left doing if I wanted to hook lots of things up this Uhur, right? I would be making one cable that goes from this to this, and another cable that goes from this to this, and maybe I find out that there's another thing that I need to hook up that uses yet a different cable. So I'd be making up a bunch of cables. So instead, what I thought was like, look, I already have cables like this for going between like my modular and other stuff and my OP1 and uh, line input. So why don't I just make a little box with a uh, MIDI on one side and just a quarter inch, sorry, I don't know what that is in metric, but also known as a tip sleeve or a tip ring sleeve cable, TRS or TS. So that's what I'm gonna build. <laughs> For sure this box is a little bit more than building a cable or two, but um, it's not that bad. I, you know, I, I think the whole thing uh, start to finish, and this is a, you know, a big old tank, it's very flexible. I think it cost me less than 20 bucks to build. And um, uh, you know, it's you know, not the best value, but whatever, it's a big metal box, it's cool. The other advantage to building in this box is that I can now have various cable lengths, and cable lengths are important, especially with um, unbalanced signals, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, uh, you want shorter cables for unbalanced signals, so I can customize the length of cable I'm using based on my situation, right? If everything on my desk, I can have a really short cable. Um, if I'm recording something that needs to be all the way across the room, then I will have to resort to a longer cable and probably pick up more line noise, but I can make, without wiring up yet another cable. So, of course, you know, there are other options uh, other than building your own cable uh, or, or buying a uh, or buying the parts to build a box like this. Some people, what they do is they buy these cables they find that have um, DIN 5 on one end, and then on the other end are 
literally five RCA cables. Um, that could be a route you could go and just, just do trial and error and see which RCA connection works for what you're trying to do. The downside for me is that I don't really use RCA cables anywhere. So I would be still needing more adapters to attach just to that RCA cable. And I just sort of don't like these floppy cables all over the place. I like things that are going to be anchored down. <laughs> um, since I'm you know, working in limited space, I need to place things carefully, especially for these videos. So um, uh, choices for you by the RCA thing, then deal with the RC then have to deal with connecting RCA adapters. Um, and you can also build your own cable using a process similar to what I'm going to do today. Um, building the cable is definitely more affordable, and it's a totally reasonable route to go. This is just my little weirdsy. I like these little metal boxes that I've started building for converting things. And, uh, you know, uh, I just like the box. Everyone's got their weirdsies. So how did I get started doing this? Um, well, uh, luckily for me, the Uber came with this owner's manual. So um, you don't always get that lucky, but... You can often find this information online somehow or another. Uh, there's manuals online, there's people on forums that will tell you these things, but uh, I'm gonna walk you through what happens if you have access to this kind of information. And then if you can get this kind of information, you can still solve the problem. So just cutting to the chase here. Um, uh, like I said, I figured out that I need the input for the radio, um, but let's kind of walk through how I figured that out. So you'll notice the voltage range is one millivolt to 400 millivolts, which is pretty low input voltage range. Um, for example, modular synthesizers put out negative 15 to positive 15 volts. So if we want full on modular out uh, of that kind of voltage, this would not be good. Um, but we're a little less concerned about the voltage range because we can always turn things down, right? Like I can always turn the volume knob down on my LP1. But what, what I noticed was the 10k ohms input impedance, and I just happened to know, and, but I confirmed it and looked it up just to make extra certain, that 10k ohms is the typical input impedance for a line input. So the input impedance of, say, your audio interface, if you plug a synthesizer directly into it, is almost certainly 10k ohms. And input impedance matters because it, it greatly affects sound quality. You want to get that right so that you're not losing frequencies. So this is for sure the right way to go. The other thing to note on this user manual is the wiring for that DIN 5 output on the Uhr is it says 1 and 4 in parallel and 2, where 2 is the ground. So uh, another thing that I happened to, to figure out after looking at this is that these connectors were often used for mono and stereo setups. So um, the way Uhr handled that, and maybe lots of other manufacturers did too, I don't really know, is that on their stereo version, one and four would be left and right. And in this case, one and four are, looks like they're both the mono channel, but we're gonna kind of confirm that hypothesis. So the first problem we're gonna solve is pretty practical. We're gonna just test um, a hypothesis that the I can plug the OP1 in and connect it to either wires one and two or four and two on the Uhr. So now I'm gonna walk through what the heck these numbered pins are. We have to figure out which pin is what. Okay, so how do we figure out which pins are one, four, and two for the thing we're about to wire up? So look at this drawing, and you can see this is what a DIN 5 cable would look like if you looked at it head on, on the, on the cable. So in this case, this is pin one, this is pin two, this is pin three, four, and five. So you've got one fully to the right. For now, uh, let's not worry about why it's like this and just be happy that there are objective truths from time to time. This is also false, but let's move on just in order to make progress despite the universe being chaos. 
So, all right, let's think this through a bit more. When you take this cable and the pins over here and you marry it with this jack here, pin one is going to be to the left. So then we've got pin one over here, two, three, four, and five. So just remember that pin one on here is just going to be, uh, or I'm sorry, the pin fully to the left here, fully counterclockwise. That's our pin one. And over here is our pin three and up here is pin two. So let's focus on pin one and pin two for what we're going to build. Okay, so let's look at the parts I've decided to use here and let's make a plan. Now then, all right, so I've got this DIN 5 connector with pin 1 over here fully to the left, pin 2 at the top. And so my hypothesis is we only need pin 1 uh, or pin 4, um, but I'm going to test that as I build this and show you the result. So uh, uh, I think I only need pin 1 or 4 because the machine's mono and it's only going to be sending s signal to 1 at a time. So I only need one or the other. Uh, but then, of course, I'll need to wire up pin 2 as the ground. Uh, won't go into the mechanics of why, but um, just that's a thing. So these are TRS connectors meant to accept a cable that looks like this. It's got a tip, ring, and sleeve, and it's got two black bands separating those. I don't need to, to use tip ring sleeve in this case, um, but this is these are the only connectors I could find that would go in a box of this type. This is a specific enclosure type uh, that's uh, standard. So, um, uh, so because I can only find TRS connectors, we're not going to be using all three contacts on here, um, and I'll show you how I deal with that um, by uh, having it accommodate a plug like this, which is tip and sleeve only. To repeat one more time now, my theory is I try to wire pin 1 from the DIN 5 to a connector on the TRS jack and pin 2 from the DN5 um, to the um, ground, which will be the sleeve on this. So let's really quick have a lesson on tip ring sleeve versus tip sleeve for people that need it. If you don't need this lesson, skip forward. So here's your quick tip sleeve versus tip ring sleeve lesson, TS, TRS. So TS means tip and sleeve. So the tip carries the signal uh, in the form of voltage from your instrument, guitar, synthesizer, whatever. And the ring is the ground. Um, again, I'm not going to get into the electronics theory of why you need a ground, but just know that without the ground, um, you, you really can't get a true signal at all. So <clears throat> in the, here we have a tip ring sleeve. Again, notice split by two black bands as opposed to just one little band here. So um, in, in, in all cases, tip ring sleeve, the tip and the ring carry signal, and the, and the sleeve down here is also the ground, same as the tip sleeve. In some cases, the tip and ring will carry stereo left and right, and in some others, they carry... Uh, a balance signal, which helps eliminate line noise from cables. Um, and in some other cases, they'll work as an insert, and this will be like the in and the out. I don't actually remember the order they go in, but um, old mixers used to use TRS connectors so that you could um, uh, insert into uh, a channel. All right, so now I'm not going to make you watch me twist wires and stuff, but um, for now I'm going to physically attach some wires to test my theories out about the Uher, and then I'm going to show you how it goes. Okay, so, uh, f quick uh, cut to the chase, I have a happy ending here. So well, let me talk through what I did here, right? So I just temporarily um, soldered some uh, very low gauge mic wire. I had to pins, pin one here for the signal and pin two for the ground. And then the signal is going to the tip connector here and the ground is going to the sleeve connector. So I've connected that up temporarily I'm going to put them in the box nicely when I'm done with this. Um, and so what I've got is an arpeggio going here on the um, OP1. And uh, I'm going to prove that um, going just from a little 
millimeter or mini jack to my quarter inch um, plug through my little adapter system here through the MIDI cable into the Uher works. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be filming this and showing it to you if it didn't work, but here we go. It's going to be fun. So, um, yeah, I'm going to um, start this arpeggio. So you can see the meter start to move. Let me turn the volume down on this. And you can see I'm getting level to tape. Now, you know, normally you kind of want to slam it to get the nice tape saturation. So you can see I barely have the um, the uh, the input gain moving. And that's because I got my OP1 all the way up. So if I turn the OP1 about halfway up, start to turn the input gain here, I've got a lot more headroom to work with, um, but I can still really jam that into the red, and um, I've got a lot I can work with here. So it works. Hooray. Um, I'll do um, a real quick assembly of this and a real quick wrap-up to um, talk about this, and uh, hope you liked it. All right, so I won't make you make you watch me solder this up, but uh, these are gonna get have to get desoldered temporarily to put, be put in this case. And um, when it's done, it's gonna look like this with um, an in and an out, and the DIN connector that connects to the Uher. Very very nice. Okay, so this this was a fair amount of work, and uh, by spending all this time doing this, I wasn't making music, which is, you know, definitely what I'd rather be doing. So if your eyes are rolling up in your head at this point of thought of doing all this, I totally get it. Don't um, don't feel like uh, you got to do this. Um, but that said, you know, some days I'm actually not feeling up to making music for whatever reason, right? Just not feeling terribly uh, inspired, or I just had a long session the day before and just feeling kind of juiced, right? So, uh, you know, fiddling around with gear is fun, um, and I like solving these problems um, when I can. You know, I can't solve all of them, so I have to take them to a tech. Um, so I save these things for a time when there's a nice opportunity to focus on, like, the mechanics of home audio. You know, I have loads of other things that I do on days where I'm not feeling the juice, right? I, I organize cables. I organize my studio in general. I dust things. Um, and sometimes it's just nice to handle the artifacts of music handle the artifacts of music. Oh yeah, that's a going on a t-shirt. So in the end, though, I will say the knowledge I picked up in the process of doing this is going to help me assess vintage gear in the future and whether it's something I should take home with me. Um, and I can potentially get deals on gear because other people will pass on things that have these unusual connectors, right? Um, for example, uh, I will talk about in a future video, I pick up loads of really cool microphones because they're older and don't use XLR or tip sleeve connectors. They use things like this or Tuchel connectors. Is it Tuchel? Tuchel? Oh, I don't know. My German's really bad. So anyway, hopefully I'm not giving away my, my little advantage on some of these microphones. I've got some excellent microphones um, and get ready to see them sometime while I nerd out on microphones that I don't use nearly enough. Um, so anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful. Um, tech talk. Talk. It's tech talk. It's tech shop talk. Goodbye.